Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a mango white claw. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking a tequila sunrise, and on today's episode, we're exploring the 1969 Chappaquiddick incident that led to the death of 28-year-old Mary Jo Kopechny. In July 1969, 37-year-old Edward Ted Kennedy and his cousin, Joseph Gargan, rented a cottage on Chappaquiddick Island, a tiny Massachusetts island accessible by ferry from Edgar Town in Martha's Vineyard. Ted was the youngest child of Joseph Sr. and Rose Kennedy and was elected to the Massachusetts Senate in 1962. Kennedy and Gargan were in town to participate in the Edgar Town Yacht Regatta as they had missed it the previous year due to the assassination of Ted's brother, Robert F. Kennedy. On the evening of July 18th, they hosted a barbecue as a reunion for the Boiler Room Girls, who were the women that had served on Robert Kennedy's 1968 presidential campaign. Six women attended, including Mary Jo Kopechny. Men in attendance included the crew of Kennedy's sailboat and political associates. A majority of the attendees were staying off the island at hotels on Martha's Vineyard. What happened that evening cannot be known for certain, but according to Kennedy, Mary Jo asked him to give her a ride back to her hotel because she wasn't feeling well. Kennedy requested the keys to his car, which he did not usually drive, from John B. Crimmins, who was serving as Kennedy's chauffeur for the trip. Kennedy estimated this as, quote-unquote, approximately 11.15 p.m. In order to get back to the hotel, they had to make the last ferry, which left the island at midnight, or else they'd need to call and arrange a later ferry. Mary Jo told no one else that she was leaving for the night with Kennedy and left her purse and hotel key at the party. Kennedy claimed that as soon as he left the party, he immediately drove a half mile north on Chappaquiddick Road, headed for the ferry landing, and mistakenly took a wrong turn onto Dyke Road instead of bearing left to stay onto the paved Chappaquiddick Road for another two and a half miles. Dyke Road leads to Dyke Bridge, a wooden structure angled obliquely to the road, crossing the channel connecting Cape Pogue Pond and Pucha Pond, leading to a barrier beach. At the time, the bridge did not have guardrails. A fraction of a second before Kennedy reached the bridge, he applied his brakes and lost control of the car, which launched over the southern end of the bridge, plunged nose first into the channel, and flipped over, landing on its roof. The exact time the crash occurred is unknown due to a conflict between the testimony of Kennedy and a deputy sheriff who claimed to have seen his car at a later time. At 12.40 a.m., part-time Deputy Sheriff Christopher Huck Look was on his way home from work. After he passed the intersection of Cemetery Road and Dyke Road, he saw a dark four-door sedan driven by a man with a woman in the front seat approaching and passing slowly in front of him. The car drove off the pavement onto Cemetery Road and stopped. Thinking the occupants of the car might be lost, Look stopped and walked towards the other vehicle. When he was 25 to 30 feet away, the car reversed and started backing up towards him. As he called out to offer help, the car moved forward and veered quickly eastward onto Dyke Road, speeding away and leaving a cloud of dust. Look recalled that the car's license plate began with an L and contained two sevens, consistent with Kennedy's license, L78207, on his Oldsmobile Delmont 88. He returned to his vehicle and continued on his way south. This is further supported by a woman who lived in the house by the bridge, reporting the sound of a car speeding toward the bridge at about midnight. Look's version, if true, leaves over an hour of Kennedy's time with Kopechny unaccounted for before the crash. Kennedy was able to swim to safety, but Mary Jo was not. Kennedy said that he called her name several times from the shore and tried to swim down to reach her seven or eight times. He then rested on the bank for about 15 minutes before he returned on foot to the cottage. He denied seeing any house with the light on during his 15-minute walk back. His route back took him past four houses from which he could have called for help before he reached the cottage but did not. 
The first of the houses was Dyke House, 150 yards from the bridge and occupied by Sylvia Mom and her family. Mom stated later that she was home, she had a phone, and that she had left a light on at the residence when she retired that evening. Kennedy returned to the cottage where the party was still in progress, but rather than alerting all the guests to the crash, he quietly spoke to Gargan and Paul Markham, the former U.S. attorney for Massachusetts. Gargan drove the group to the site of the crash to try to rescue Mary Jo from the car. Gargan and Markham jumped into the pond and tried repeatedly to rescue her, but were not able to due to strong tidal currents. After they recovered, Gargan drove Kennedy and Markham to the ferry landing. The three were all lawyers, and they discussed what they should do while standing next to a public phone booth at the landing. Gargan and Markham insisted multiple times that the crash had to be reported to the authorities. At the ferry landing, Kennedy dove into the water and swam across the channel to Egerton. He then walked to his hotel room, removed his clothes, and laid on his bed. Gargan and Markham had driven the rental car back to the cottage. They entered the cottage at approximately 2 a.m., but told no one what had happened. When questioned by the guests, they said that Kennedy had swum back to Egerton and Mary Jo was probably at her hotel. Gargan then told everyone to get some sleep. At 8 a.m., Gargan and Markham crossed back to Egerton on the ferry and met Kennedy. Not long after 8 a.m., a man and a 15-year-old boy saw Kennedy's vehicle in the pond and called the police. Egerton Police Chief Dominic James Arena arrived at the scene and tried to examine the interior of the submerged car before summoning a trained scuba diver and equipment capable of towing or winching the vehicle out of the water. John Farrer, captain of the Egerton Fire Rescue Unit, arrived and discovered Mary Jo's body in the back seat. Rosemary Keogh's purse was found in the front passenger compartment of the car, causing Arena to misidentify Mary Jo. Police then traced the car's license plates back to Kennedy. As this was going on, Kennedy, Gargan, and Markham returned to Chappaquiddick Island on the ferry, where Kennedy made a series of telephone calls from a payphone near the ferry crossing. Rather than notify law enforcement of the accident, Kennedy called his brother-in-law, Stephen Edward Smith, Congressman John B. Tooney, and others. Kennedy was still at the payphone when he heard that his car in Kopechny's body had been discovered. He then went to the police station in Egerton with Markham. He asked to make some telephone calls. When Arena returned to the station at 10 a.m., he was quote-unquote stunned to learn Kennedy had already knew of the accident and the true identity of the victim and admitted he was the driver. Arena led Kennedy to another empty office where he could privately dictate his statement to Markham. In it, he did not mention the party or Gargan and Markham's rescue attempts, and he brushed aside the 10-hour delay in reporting the case. Associate Medical Examiner Dr. Ronald Mills was called to the crash site to examine Mary Jo's body as lead medical examiner Dr. Robert Nevin was off. He was satisfied that the cause of death was accidental drowning, but asked the district attorney's office for direction on whether an autopsy was necessary and was told it was not as long as there were no signs of foul play and he was satisfied it was a drowning. He signed the death certificate, released the body, and directed that a blood sample be collected and sent to the state police for analysis of alcohol content. The result was 0.09%, which, given Mary Jo's weight, equated to about five drinks of liquor within one hour before her death. Due to the period of time that went by following the crash, Kennedy's blood alcohol level could not be tested. Mary Jo's funeral was held on Tuesday, July 22nd in Pennsylvania, which the Kennedy family attended. Medical examiner Nevin strongly disagreed with Mills' decision to forego an autopsy, believing that ruling out foul play would work to Kennedy's advantage. Many believe that Mary Jo's body was rushed off the island in order to avoid an autopsy. When Kennedy returned to his family's home in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, his team knew that political damage had been done and that Kennedy's chance of running for president in 1972 was off the table. Their concern was protecting him from a charge of manslaughter. Kennedy's arraignment was held on July 25, 1969. 
Kennedy pleaded guilty to a charge of leaving the scene of an accident causing bodily injury. His attorneys argued that any jail sentence should be suspended, and the prosecutors agreed by citing his age, character, and prior reputation. Kennedy was sentenced to two months in prison, which was suspended, and his license was suspended for six months as required by Massachusetts law. The presiding judge said, quote, He has already been and will continue to be punished far beyond anything this court can impose, end quote. Though the defense argued that Kennedy had a quote-unquote unblemished record, that was far from the truth. During his college days, Kennedy built a record of reckless driving and driving without a license. Following his arraignment, Kennedy gave a televised speech about the accident. In it, he denied partaking in any quote-unquote immoral conduct with Mary Jo or driving under the influence. He said that his conduct during the hours immediately after the accident quote, made no sense to me at all end quote, and said that his doctors had informed him he had suffered, quote unquote, cerebral concussion and shock. He called his failure to report the accident to the police immediately, quote unquote, indefensible, and called on the people of Massachusetts to decide if he should resign as senator. His statement was negatively received and left many with more questions than answers. After getting a favorable response and messages sent to him, Kennedy announced on July 30th that he would remain in the Senate and run for re-election the next year. District Attorney Edmund Dennis brought forward an inquest against Kennedy. Dennis petitioned for exhumation and autopsy of Mary Jo's body, and on September 18, 1969, he publicly disclosed that blood had been found on her long sleeve blouse and in her mouth and nose, quote, which may or may not be consistent with death by drowning, end quote. Mary Jo's parents opposed the exhumation and the request was ultimately denied by a judge. The inquest convened in Egerton in January 1970. At the request of Kennedy's lawyers, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court ordered it to be performed secretly with Judge James A. Boyle presiding. Kennedy testified that Mary Jo had asked him to drop her off at her hotel, and since his chauffeur was still enjoying his dinner, he did not think it was necessary to ask him to drive. He also testified that he never stopped on Cemetery Road, never backed up, never saw the deputy, and never saw another car or person after he left the cottage with Mary Jo. He further claimed that after he turned onto Dyke Road, he was driving and did not realize that he was no longer headed west towards the ferry landing, but was instead heading east towards the barrier beach. Kennedy testified that he, quote, had full intention of reporting it. And I mentioned to Gargan and Markham something like, you can take care of the other girls. I will take care of the accident. That is what I said. And I dove into the water. End quote. At 8 a.m., Gargan and Markham found him at his hotel room where they had a quote unquote heated conversation in Kennedy's room. According to Kennedy's testimony, the two men asked why he had not reported the accident, and he responded by telling them, quote, about my own thoughts and feelings as I swam across that channel, that somehow when they arrived in the morning, that they were going to say that Mary Jo was still alive. End quote. Markham testified that after their rescue attempt, Kennedy was sobbing and on the verge of a breakdown. Gargan and Markham testified that they assumed that Kennedy was going to inform the authorities about the accident once he got back to Egerton, so they did not do the reporting themselves. Diver John Farrer testified that it looked like Mary Jo was holding herself up to get a last breath of air. It was a consciously assumed position according to Ferrer, and she didn't drown, but actually died of suffocation. Rigor Morris was apparent. Her hands were clancing the back seat, and her face was turned upward. Ferrer testified that Mary Jo's body was pressed up in the car in a spot where an air bubble would have formed. He interpreted that to mean that she had survived in the air bubble after the car submerged, and he concluded that, quote, had I received a call within five to ten minutes of the accident occurring and was able, as I was the following morning, to be at the victim's side within 25 minutes of receiving the call, in such event, there is a strong possibility that she would have been alive on removal from the submerged car, end quote. 
Having found probable cause of a crime under Massachusetts law, Judge Boyle could have issued a warrant for his arrest, but he did not do so. Despite Boyle's findings, Dennis chose not to prosecute Kennedy for manslaughter. A grand jury on Martha's Vineyard conducted a two-day investigation in April 1970, but issued no indictment after which Boyle made his 763-page inquest report public. The findings in his report included these statements from Boyle. Quote, I believe it probable that Kennedy knew of the hazard that lay ahead of him on Dyke Road. But that, for some reason, not apparent from the testimony, he failed to exercise due care as he approached the bridge, end quote. And he also said, quote, I therefore find there is probable cause to believe that Edward M. Kennedy operated his motor vehicle negligently and that such operation appears to have contributed to the death of Mary Jo Kopechny, end quote. The Kopechny family did not bring any legal action against Kennedy, but did receive a payment of $90,904 from him personally and $50,000 from his insurance company. The Kopechnies later explained their decision not to take legal action by saying, quote, we figured that people would think we were looking for blood money, end quote. The quality of the investigation into the crash has been scrutinized, particularly whether official deference was given to a powerful and influential politician and his family. There was talk of a cover-up of Kennedy and his press team attempting to downplay the incident so as not to harm his future political aspirations. The eight remaining party attendees, five men and three women, left Chappaquiddick by the evening after the accident and have since kept their silence. Since Kennedy did not mention to police that there had been a party, none of them were interviewed by law enforcement while they were still on the island. It's clear that Kennedy's team tried to stall the release of his police statement, possibly in order to tweak his story to make more sense. Several theories about the accident were speculated on, including that Ted left the vehicle after being seen by Officer Look, and that Mary Jo was actually the one driving at the time of the accident. That Mary Jo and Kennedy were headed to the beach and not the ferry. That Kennedy was driving with Rosemary Keogh in the passenger seat when they unknowingly drove off with a sleeping Mary Jo in the back. The Manchester Union leader wrote that during the hours between the time Kennedy claimed the accident had occurred and his report of it to the police, 17 long-distance phone calls were charged to his credit card. Five of them were made shortly before midnight from the Chappaquiddick Cottage and the other 12 from the Shire Town Inn. This implied that Kennedy and his aides may have been trying to develop a solid cover story for Kennedy. Kennedy and his wife, Joan, separated in 1977, although they still staged joint appearances at some public events. In 1979, Kennedy announced his run for president. The Chappaquiddick incident emerged as a more significant issue than the staff had expected, with several newspaper columnists and editorials criticizing Kennedy's answers on the topic. Concerns over Chappaquiddick and issues related to his personal character prevented Kennedy from gaining the support of many people who were unhappy with Jimmy Carter. During a St. Patrick's Day parade in Chicago, Kennedy had to wear a bulletproof vest due to assassination threats and hecklers yelled at him, quote unquote, where's Mary Jo? He eventually lost the Democratic nomination to incumbent Jimmy Carter. Kennedy's personal life continued to be troubled during the 1980s. He drank heavily at times and was known to quote-unquote chase women. In 1985, a waitress claimed that Kennedy and Senator Chris Dodd sexually assaulted her. Female Senate staffers from the late 80s and early 90s claimed that Kennedy was on an informal list of male senators who were known for harassing women regularly, such as while alone in elevators. Kennedy once again was under media scrutiny when he testified in his nephew, William Kennedy Smith's 1991 sexual assault trial. Kennedy served as Massachusetts senator for three more decades after the crash and would become one of the nation's most respected elder statesmen with a long list of major legislative accomplishments. On August 25, 2009, Kennedy died of a malignant brain tumor at the age of 77. In True Compass, a memoir published after his death, Kennedy wrote that his actions the night of the action were quote-unquote inexcusable and that he quote-unquote made terrible decisions. He knew at the time the accident would be devastating to his family as well as damaging to his political career. Finally, Kennedy wrote that 
quote, my burden is nothing compared to Capetne's loss and the suffering her family had endured. She also didn't deserve to be linked to me in a romantic way. She deserved better than that, end quote. Gwen Kopechny, the mother of Mary Jo, told McCall's magazine that she believed Kennedy had been behaving erratically after the accident due to shock and a minor concussion. But what she didn't know was how Gargan and Markham didn't report the accident or force Ted to do so. She said, quote, this is the big hurt, the nightmare we have to live with for the rest of our lives, that Mary Jo was left in the water for nine hours. She didn't belong there, end quote. Since 1969, the Chappaquiddick incident has been used repeatedly as a go-to insult by conservative politicians, particularly when one of their own has come under scrutiny for a D.C. scandal. The story was occasionally resurrected to point to questions that remained unanswered, even as Kennedy remained in the Senate until his death. In 2017, the movie Chattaquiddick was released. There we go. Director John Curran said, quote, the two people who really know what happened that night are dead, Ted and Mary Jo, and the others around them, the ones that are still alive, they aren't going to say anything, end quote. He went on to say, quote, whether you're on the left or right side of the aisle, it's imperative that we take a pretty hard, unvarnished look at our heroes these days. The time is done to let all these guys skate by. I think if this story happened now, it would have overshadowed the moon landing, end quote. Del, what are your thoughts on Chappaquiddick? I think this is a story of the cover-up being worse than what happened. I think that if honesty had prevailed in this case, while he couldn't have avoided the political damage done, I think that the damage to how people felt about his moral character could have been averted. I think that it is very clear that during the time between when the incident happened and when the police were actually notified, the Kennedys were doing everything they could to protect Ted and his freedom, honestly. I do think that one of the most curious things is the fact that despite the judge's findings, they still didn't prosecute. And I think that could be related to who the Kennedys were and what Ted's significance in the Senate was. I think, unfortunately, the political ramifications really overshadow the death of Mary Jo. And it's sad to think that someone's political career was put over someone else's life. But that's what happened. I do think it's always curious when people use someone's death as a whataboutism. I think it's gross. I think that it definitely shouldn't be used that way. And I would hope that conservative politicians would have more morality related to family values than they obviously show when it comes to discussing this incident. One other thing that I found really interesting in this case was the fact that the family didn't sue because they were worried about how people would feel about them if they did. I think that's really sad that they had to even think of that. I definitely think they should have sued despite the personal funds that were given to them by Ted. I don't think that people should, you know, rake someone else over the coals. But the fact that he spent so much time trying to downplay his role in her death. The least that could have happened is a civil suit in this case. What are your thoughts on it? I 100% think there is some type of cover-up involved. I don't think there's any way around it. I don't think his story makes sense. What I think, I don't know for sure what happened, but I think that they were probably headed to the beach, maybe for some intimacy. I don't know. I don't want to say that of Mary Jo. I do find it kind of weird that even as he's dying, he's still saying, oh, she was linked to me romantically and like, what a shame for her. I think that's weird. And I feel like that's like the least of the issues in this story. 
So I feel like for him to point that out so late in his life is probably, there's probably a, a little bit of truth to it. I think he was obviously looking out for his career before Mary Jo, a woman who served his family. I think he was in a bind. He knew his career and family life could be affected either way. I'm by no means excusing what he did, but if we want to maybe try to look at it a little more from Kennedy's perspective, he had a lot of pressure on him. I think from his family and from the public, he was compared to his brothers by his parents a lot. I think he was in his early political career, he was somewhat early in his career when this was going, when this happened, and he was just starting to earn some respect. And I think he had personal pressure too. Like I said, he had three children of his own, and then he was a surrogate dad to his 13 nieces and nephews who did not have dads. And we'll talk more about that too. But I think he was just really looking out for himself. I'm sure he was probably scared, which is understandable. I guess they thought it would be easier to cover up some type of accident with someone dead. But to me, that's not the case. It's so bizarre. I don't know what I think about some of these other conspiracy theories. Like I said, I feel like they most likely were going to the beach. But if he was drunk, which I kind of lean towards the fact that he he could have been, or that he probably was, that maybe he could have easily taken a wrong turn if he had been drinking. I don't think it's that strange that Mary Jo didn't have her purse on her, because if she had been drinking, like her blood alcohol says she was, maybe she just didn't think to do it. Or maybe she grabbed, if she was drinking or if she was in a hurry, she grabbed the wrong bag. I don't think it's that that hard to do. I think what Judge Boyle said is really telling in that first arraignment about how he's going to, Ted Kennedy is going to be punished much more than a court could ever do. I think that's beautifully said. And it it absolutely is true, considering he never got to become president. Whether he wanted to or not, there's some kind of like argument with that about how he wanted to support his family instead of focusing more on his political career. I think regardless of whether or not he thought Mary Jo was alive, he absolutely should have called for help because I think there is some kind of, there's a little bit of questioning as to did he think she was alive, just like suffering in there, or did he think she was automatically dead? Because his statements kind of flip-flop, but I think Markham and Gargum should have been held accountable in some way because they knew what happened to Mary Jo. And again, whether or not they also thought she was dead or alive, someone should have called for help. It's absolutely despicable that they put Kennedy's future and kind of their futures riding his coattails ahead of Mary Jo. And again, someone that served the Kennedy family proudly. And we're going to take a little bit of more of a look into Mary Jo's life towards the end of this episode, but it's really despicable. I found this quote from Politico that says, to be truly guilty, Kennedy would have had to believe that there was a chance to rescue Kopechny and knowingly refused to do it or to take it. So again, regardless, they should have, someone should have done something to help. I understand why Gargan and Markham probably would have assumed he was going to call for help because any, I think person in their right mind would have, but I think they should have done their due diligence and called for help too. There's a little bit of a controversy of whether or not he really like was injured or suffering from the accident. Like the family doctors said, I think it was very much blown out of proportions because maybe not his mental state, but if he was, you know, had a concussion and was physically injured somehow in this accident, how did he swim across the body of water? so easily. It doesn't make any sense to me. There's just so many questions. So much is unanswered. And again, like, what are they covering up? Is it a relationship between them? Was, did Kennedy want a relationship and Mary Jo didn't? There was a lot of talk even before this about these par- a party that they had had at this cottage before and other parties that he was having. Kennedy was known as a partier. So, I think this history tracks into this incident as to what happened. I do believe the officer's take of the incident. I don't believe everything Ted Kennedy said. I think that there is bits and pieces to bits and pieces of truth in his statement, but it's just so all over the place. 
And Del, what you said about her family not wanting to seek blood money is really sad. And I think they would have been 100% justified in seeking, like suing him somehow. And I think they probably felt like they were in a bit of a bind because, like we said, Mary Jo did work for Robert F. Kennedy and she really enjoyed her work there. And Kennedy's, I think Robert Kennedy's widow, I think it was her, she spoke with Mary Jo's family and she was like very supportive. They said that she really was there to help them. She was talking to them, talking them through things and they really appreciated that. So I think they were in like a little bit of a bind between like this family has been good to my daughter, but they're also the cause of her death. So what, how do we react? What do we do with that? We can't mention Chabaquitic and the Kennedy family without talking about the Kennedy curse. The Kennedy family has been plagued by tragic illnesses, accidents, and deaths that have left some wondering if there is a curse on the family. The tragedy suffered by the Kennedys combined with their glamour, ambition, and power has captured the imagination of people across the world for well over half a century. During Ted's televised statement on the accident, he said he wondered if, quote, some awful curse actually did hang over all the Kennedys, end quote. So I think this idea kind of started then. At the time of the accident, Ted was his parents' last living son. His brothers, John and Robert, were assassinated, and his oldest brother, Joseph, was killed during World War II, which we will talk about more in a minute. Sometimes people consider as part of the Kennedy curse is Rosemary's lobotomy. Rosemary was Joseph Sr. and Ethel Kennedy's third child. The Kennedy family described her as, quote-unquote, intellectually slow. During her birth, Rosemary was deprived of oxygen as her mother and nurse waited for the doctor to arrive. She struggled to read and write, and she suffered from mood swings, seizures, and violent outbursts. As she grew older, she became more rebellious, and the family worried she would do something that could tarnish the Kennedy reputation. In hopes of quote-unquote curing her, her father allowed doctors to remove part of Rosemary's brain in 1951, which was a relatively new procedure known as a prefrontal lobotomy. The operation only worsened her condition. She stopped speaking, started mumbling, and stared at walls for hours on end. Rosemary was essentially kept a secret following the surgery until her sister Eunice wrote about her in the Saturday Evening Post in 1962. Rosemary was institutionalized until her death in 2005 at the age of 86. There have been several deadly plane crashes within the Kennedy family. In 1964, Ted survived a plane crash that killed two passengers. Kennedy suffered a broken back and ribs. Federal investigators blamed the crash on pilot error. Following the crash, Robert Kennedy remarked to aide Ed Gunthman, quote, someone up there doesn't like us, end quote. Joe Kennedy Jr. died in a 1944 air disaster after volunteering to pilot a secret and extremely dangerous World War II bombing mission in Nazi-occupied France. Two in-flight explosions occurred, the cause of which has never been found. In 1948, Ted's sister Kathleen Kennedy died in a plane crash in France along with three others. She was just 28. In 1999, JFK Jr., his wife Carolyn, and her sister Lauren died in a plane crash on his way to his cousin Rory Kennedy's wedding in Hyas Point. There have also been several overdoses in the Kennedy family. David Kennedy, RFK's son, died in 1984 in a Palm Beach, Florida hotel after a drug overdose. He was 28 years old. He had reportedly watched his father's assassination on live TV as a boy and later struggled with addiction. In 2019, search the Kennedy Hill, granddaughter of Robert F. Kennedy, died of an accidental overdose after being found unresponsive at the Kennedy compound in Highest Point. 
Edward Jr. and his brother Patrick Kennedy told CNN they reject the idea of a family curse. Quote, no, no, obviously my dad had a sense of spirituality that transcended his ability to face these problems, you know, in a way that would have otherwise paralyzed the normal person, end quote. And Patrick Kennedy said this in 2009. Edward Jr. added, quote, the Kennedy family has had to endure these things in a very open way, but our family is just like every other family in America in many ways, end quote. So do you believe in the Kennedy family curse? I don't believe that there is a curse around them. I think this is a situation where the family is so public and so large that anytime anything negative happens to them, the results are amplified and we all know about it. Things that if it happened in another family, we likely wouldn't hear about, especially the specifics around it. So while I wouldn't say I believe in a curse, quote unquote, I do think that it is a shame that one family has had to go through so many untimely deaths, so many just horrific things. And just one of these incidents would be enough to say that, yeah, maybe someone above is not really looking out for them. I mean, in addition to the things that we listed, you also had two assassinations in the same family within, you know, less than five years of each other. That alone would cause someone to maybe not want to join the Kennedy family. How about you? Do you believe in the curse? I don't. It definitely is a bizarre set of circumstances. And it does like make me wonder sometimes. But like you said, they're a very public family. They're a very large family. And they're a large family with pretty much whatever they want within reach. So they're bound to face tragedies. I would say, especially with drug and alcohol abuse. I mean, we see that with celebrities all the time too. I saw an interesting argument against the Kennedy family saying that some of what is considered the curse and these tragedies like Chappaquiddick, like Rosemary's lobotomy, like the one son being accused of sexual assault, a lot of that is their own doing. Is it a curse that that Ted Kennedy was behaving irresponsibly and drove off a bridge and killed someone? That's his fault. Yes. It's not some curse that all of a sudden he veered to the left and they drove off the bridge. Again, it's the family's, particularly Joseph Sr.'s own doing that he was embarrassed to have a daughter with some type of disability and wanted to fix it and it made things worse. That's their own doing. Of course, that doesn't mean we can't sympathize or empathize with this family because it is horrible that a family needs to go through so many horrible things. And these are just a few and these are kind of older situations for the most part, but there's like more recent stuff of people going missing, different things like that. So it is a very sad thing. There's no question about it, but do I think it's a curse? No. Next, we wanted to talk about how this case and how people talked about the Chavaquitic incident kind of highlighted the disposability of women in general and at this time. Mary Jo was referred to in the initial newspaper reports as a quote-unquote blonde. That was it. In one article from the National Review, which came out in 1969, Mary Jo was referred to as quote-unquote moderately attractive in a muted way. The accident was satirized by Time Magazine and National Lampoon. And like we said earlier, everything focused on Kennedy and the impact on his career rather than the fact that Mary Jo, a woman, was killed. In an era when women were only beginning to enter the workforce in high numbers, press coverage only added to their objectification, like we were kind of talking about. But Chappaquiddick screenwriter Taylor Allen said, quote, Mary Jo was an intelligent, strong woman who worked for Bobby Kennedy in his campaign in a high capacity and did really great work, including transcribing and then adding to the speech he gave about Vietnam, end quote. So let's end this episode by talking about who Mary Jo was. 
She grew up in New Jersey and was the only child of homemaker Gwen and insurance salesman Joseph Kopechny. After earning a business degree, she moved to Montgomery, Alabama for a year at the Mission of St. Jude, which participated in the Civil Rights Movement. She also taught business classes in typing and shorthand at Montgomery Catholic High School and was an advisor to the school newspaper. She eventually got a job in Robert Kennedy's Senate office. During his 1968 presidential campaign, she helped write the candidate's speeches. Mary Jo proved herself adept by helping to write an anti-Vietnam War speech for RFK and helped write the address announcing his ill-fated candidacy for president. She also played on Robert F. Kennedy's office softball team playing catcher. Mary Jo was devastated by the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy in June of 1968. After working briefly for the Kennedy proxy campaign of George McGovern, she said that she could never return to work on Capitol Hill, saying, quote, I just feel Bobby's presence everywhere. I can't go back because it will never be the same again, end quote. But as her father later said, quote, politics was her life, end quote. On the 25th anniversary of her death in 1994, Mary Jo's family said that Kennedy had never apologized directly to them over his role in it. Other members of the Kennedy family had written letters to them. With their only child gone, they never felt that justice had really been done in this case. Kennedy biographer Peter Canellos have written of the aftermath, quote, every day that he lived was one that Mary Jo, a talented woman with political interests of her own, would not. It seemed cosmically unfair that he should have a second act when she couldn't even complete her first, end quote. Because Mary Jo had been a strong believer in education and was deeply Catholic, family members started a scholarship fund in Mary Jo's name at nearby Miserconia University. Del, do you have any closing thoughts on any of this? I mean, I think just in closing, we just in general need to do a better job of recognizing the victims and recognizing their humanity and, you know, never putting someone's humanity over someone else's reputation or career. Yeah, for sure. I have to say my blood boiled when I heard that magazine or whatever it is, talk about how attractive she was to, and to call her moderately attractive in a muted way. What is the point of that? I don't understand. I think Mary Jo sounded like a really amazing person and who knows what she could have accomplished if she had been given more time in her life. She could have probably I don't know, been like a trailblazer for women in politics and been a very much well-respected person like Ted Kennedy was. Who knows? That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the Chappaquiddick incident. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode. As always, stay safe.